able to join us. So this is a prayer from Padre Gotuma, a prayer for groups. God of groups, you are within and beyond all of our borders, our names for you, our words about you, our gatherings, our stories about you. We seek to praise, but sometimes we imprison. May we always be curious about what is beyond borders, going there gently, knowing you have always been there. We ask this because we know that you are within and beyond all our groups and our stories. Amen. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Dre Taylor. Um, as I said, he is the oral historian at William & Mary. Um, he began that in um, August of 2020, I guess. Uh, that's when this post is from. And he was telling us he's originally from Philadelphia and has lived many places, um, most in Virginia one time before and recently in North Carolina, uh, where he had a background in print journalism and got his master's at North Carolina State University. And he loves cooking and spending time with his family. And I know because when we were setting the state, um, he told me that his birthday was last Wednesday, that he just had a birthday. So happy birthday. Thank you. And thanks so much for being with us. I'm gonna spotlight you um, so that that should allow everybody to see you on the screen. And I do wanna invite everybody to mute because um, that helps the sound be better for all the rest of us. And we'll have some time for questions at the end. Thanks, take it away. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as everybody said, my name is Dre Taylor and I enjoy talking to people and I most importantly enjoy listening to people because it's the stories that I get to hear uh, that A, give historical context to, uh, for me, but B, uh, gives, it's, as I look at oral history collection uh, as a way of healing for other people because you get a chance to talk through uh, your story and you get to hear things, you get to express yourself by sharing your story. Um, with oral history collection, uh, it's a very light process, a uh, very easy process, uh, but it, it can be tedious at times. So I have a very short video uh, that I wanna share with everybody. It's about two minutes long. I thought it was uh, three minutes, but it's about two minutes long. And then I also have a uh, uh, cheat sheet, but we're also going to walk through uh, how to do an oral history tonight, and I'm going to use Mr. Pickett Miles as the as my subject. So what I'm going to do is share my screen now with everyone. Collecting oral histories is very important uh, to historical research. As an oral historian here at the College of William and Mary, what I've done is begin to collect oral histories from the community that feed into the history that we're collecting at the college. For instance, talking to people about memory uh, to get historical context for events that may have happened here in Williamsburg and beyond is very important to understanding the story of William and Mary. Oral history work is important because what we do is we take the memories of people uh, who may have been at a historical event, uh, have had family members that were there, have had context uh, that will add to the story and help develop the narrative uh, fully. Also, what we want to do with oral histories is take those stories and create a space for them uh, within the, the digital world so people can not only see the video recording or listen to the the audio recording, uh, but get a chance to look at the transcripts as well. Once you get into the process of planning for an oral history, what you do uh, is you identify your, your subject and you make sure that that subject fits into the narrative that you're, you're looking into. Once you have that, you begin the process of, of developing a relationship and rapport with those individuals. Uh, you, you bring them in for an interview, be it by phone, or you can do one that's uh, 
more video based and bring them in. And once you do that, then you have the beginning parts of the oral history project. What you see at the end is you have this great oral history that you can also interject into historical timelines and be able to identify other instances instance that may have happened, or you can just have fun with learning about a new time period. Okay. So as the video uh, said, Oral histories, the, the, the big part about oral histories is to have fun. Uh, because too often I think that the, the art form of communicating with people uh, has disappeared. And with me, uh, the biggest thing that got me interested in doing oral history work, um, spawns, it spawns back uh, to my time with my grandfather. Uh, he died when I was a freshman in high school. And at the time of his death, the one thing that I did not have anymore was him to tell the stories. And as I got older and was able to uh, conduct research myself, what I found is all the stories I thought were just grandpa's old tales of the war were actually reality. Uh, I was able to get his service records uh, and everything. And, and what I noticed is all of the stories that he had told me of how he had uh, captured POWs and he was in charge of of keeping the POWs in their camp in the Philippines. I'm like, okay, that's interesting, right, Grandpa? Everybody believes this story. But to see the written documentation of it, I felt bad because I didn't remember a lot of the stories and I, I tried to brush them off as just him making himself sound like he was a bigger than life hero. And what I noticed is there's a, there is a need to capture these types of stories because the one thing we all know is that someday we, we have a place that we're going to return to. And my grandfather, not only did he take his war stories, but he took the recipe for his biscuits. And oral histories don't just stop at the, you know, the discussion of history. What I also focus on with some other research that I'm doing is that we focus on how recipes uh, have their way of not finding themselves onto paper and how important it is to share those stories uh, of recipes and where the recipes come from, because then you have an understanding, a greater understanding of, of the individual who you're speaking with. And I just think that that's something that's very critical uh, because we focus on the day-to-day -day and we often skip over the food part. All of us need food as, as a source of energy to continue on. And within those, within every bite of every dish, of every meal, of every day, there is some aspect of your personal history within it. Uh, so it's, it's, when I conduct oral histories, often I will intertwine questions about food because you'd be surprised how often people remember times of cooking with their mother or their grandmother or grandfather. And that becomes a part of your story. And it's a part of your story that's very important because one, it's how you eat. And often the foods we eat are associated with our cultural heritage. And if you leave out your cultural heritage, then you've left out a part of you. You know, so it's not just, oh, you know, so how many colors do you like? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite outfit? It goes beyond that. And interviews, oral history interviews with me are very in-depth and so in-depth that you don't realize how in-depth I've gone. And at the end of every one, my biggest question I ask is, how do you feel? Because you've had a chance to divulge so much information that you didn't even realize that you had captured all of within yourself. And we all have the ability. I may have a title. I don't believe in titles. Titles are cute for some occasions, but I talk to people. You know, I I, I talk to people in the grocery store. I talk to people in the streets, you know. If you don't want to talk, don't get a seat next to me on a plane because if it's the, for the people who flew to South Africa with me, that 16 hour flight, I'm certain they were ready to get off the plane at hour one. But I just love talking to people because we all may look different, but no matter how different we look, we all have similar stories. And it's just amazing to see how we all fit within the context of life. You know, and I, I explained that to a person before where, uh, it was an Indian uh, 
friend of mine and he said, no, we're all very different. And I said, so when you got married, what was on the menu? He said, well, we had a chicken, we had a fish and we had a vegetarian. I said, oh, that's funny because I had the same thing at my wedding. You know, so it, it's once we start to talk, the more we realize how intertwined we are. And it's just an amazing thing. So any questions before I go forward? I'm here to, to answer any questions anyone may have. I remember when we were um, first talking about this and I was telling you how we um, were starting Easter season um, with this visit from Jocelyn Henry Whitehead from New Zion Baptist Church, who is gonna talk about healing. And you said that really resonated with your, um, your kind of approach to oral history. So I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, definitely. So the healing aspect of it, uh, the more we talk about things, it's, it's, we're lifting weight off of ourselves. Um, the healing process within my oral histories, when I begin to ask questions about family, uh, I try not to be intrusive with the question, but intrusive with the question, if that makes any sense. So I may say to you, explain how your dad may have discipline you versus your brother. And I'll never forget one woman just began crying and I didn't understand it, you know, and I said, well, it, you know, what's, what's wrong, are you okay? And she says, I watched my dad beat my brother for things that I had done. And I never got a chance to apologize or tell my dad the truth of what happened. And it was a weight lifted off of her. And it was the moment where I realized that healing through talk and it's not just a psychiatrist who does this, all of us have the capability, but it's the one thing I wanted to focus on the most because then you really get into the deeper stories of people. Um, speaking with the descendants of formerly enslaved people two weeks ago uh, in Charlottesville, uh, I had gone on a research trip and I had requested that we do the interviews on the former plant on a plantation where the, their ancestors were, were kept and, and were held as enslaved people. And the one lady said, I remember my grandmother telling me stories about her great great grandmother where she had gotten her recipes from. And it goes back to the food part. But she said, I never once sat in an area where that was prepared. And I said, well, how does this make you feel sitting in a place where your ancestors prepared meals as enslaved people and the tears started flowing. And she said, I never thought I would see the day where I had the heart to come here and talk. And then we started talking about other recipes that have been passed down in the family. And she looked and she said, I think this is where it started. I think this is where it came from. And afterwards, this was the first time I'd ever done this. I took a picture with her because she asked if she could take a picture to mark this day. Then I posted the picture onto social media and I have a friend in New Orleans who says, how'd you get a picture with my mom's old grade school teacher? And I said, I had no idea that your family was from Virginia. And she says, yeah, I don't have a, a, a New Orleans twang. I'm from Virginia, you know, that's our roots. And that woman's story went more because now the shortbread that she was talking about that she had gotten from her family. Now this young lady said, I remember when my mom would talk about stories when she would go to class and on Fridays, Miss Bertine would bring in shortbread cookies. So now you're seeing the extension of these things. And now her mom makes shortbread cookies and shares with them. But the idea came from this woman in Virginia. And it's, it becomes a healing part because her mother was gone. So now she saw this picture of a woman who she knew her mother knew, but it's just like, wait a minute, she's still alive? How do you have this picture with her? When was this? I said it was two days ago. And you, you begin to see the power of words. You know, we, we too often, I think we don't put enough stock in the usage of our words and we don't feel like our words are important. I know for some time I felt as though my words weren't important. And then I began my career in journalism. And I began to question, you know, people. And I'll never forget the first time that I had asked a mother, because I, I was a crime reporter for 14 or the 15 years I was a journalist. And I'll never forget the first time I asked a woman, I said, so now that your son is gone, where do you go from here? And it was just this pause. 
And she says, I don't know. And then it's at that point that I realized that I had an opportunity to ask this woman a better question, and I didn't. The next one, and these were all homicides uh, that I dealt with mostly. Uh, to record, it was two, at least 270 homicides that I've covered in my career. And the next time I went and there was a woman, she was grieving and she was standing next to me while her son was under a tarp in the street. And I looked at her and I said, tell me about your son. And she said, excuse me? And I said, tell me about your son. We can pull criminal records. We can pull, what did your son mean to your family? And she went on this long rant, but it was just so freeing for her to be able to tell the story of her son and his birth and how difficult of a birth his was compared to her other children. And before I knew it, we were standing there laughing and joking and her son is still laying there deceased. And she's at, I was walking away, she said, thank you for letting me tell his story for him. And that was one of the moments that changed my career because I had applied to grad school. And I said, I have to do this. I have to get the real stories. I have to get the real context because it's a very freeing thing. So my focus a lot, and you'll see it in the sheet that I have to share, is to help people heal by telling their story. Um, so I, I hope I didn't go too long about the healing process with it, but there was a reason for explaining it that way. That was great. Thank so what we can do now, um, and it's still, we still have some time to do this. So I say, pick it if you are ready uh, to be my, my subject for the evening, then we can go ahead and give this a try. Okay. All right, so what we're gonna do now, everyone, is this is how an oral history is done. Um, it's, like I said, it's fun. Once you get the initial questions out of the way, everything from there is all, I'm not gonna say downhill, I'm not gonna say uphill, but it's a straight across race to the finish line. So uh, usually the way it starts is this. Hello, my name is Andre Taylor, oral historian at the College of William & Mary. Today is Wednesday, May 12th, 2021. Uh, today, I am here with Mr. Pickett Miles. Uh, Mr. Pickett Miles, can you please, for the record, uh, say where you're from and how old you are? I'm 78, um, been in Williamsburg since 75. Came to Williamsburg, it's my dog in the background, greeting my daughter who's coming for a visit. Um, came here from Clemson, Went to Virginia Seminary, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill as over again state. Uh, grew up in Asheville, North Carolina. So you said you came here uh, to Williamsburg. What brought you to Williamsburg initially? St. Martin's offered me a job as the third priest and the first rector in 1975. So in 1975, when you arrived, what was the congregation like? What was the makeup? How, how large was the congregation? We were under 100. Um, St. Martin's was a little ahead of its time. It had two or three planks in its platform that were very important. One plank was we were committed to giving away 50% of all money that came in. Another was that we were gonna have Eucharist at every service. Another plank was that we were gonna have one worship service per Sunday because we didn't want an eight o'clock service, a 10 o'clock service and an 11 o'clock service. We wanted to be a single parish family and we wanted to be as integrated as we could be. When you arrived, did you have a family yourself or was it just you? No, it was my wife and two daughters. What was it like, the, the transition for them when they arrived here? What was that like for them? Well, Dre, it was a little shocking. We had been, uh, I was the assistant to the rector in Clemson. And, and at that point and at that time and in that place, the assistant could do no wrong. 
And so I came to Reevesburg thinking I was going to inherit that, that reception. And it seemed for some time that not only could I do a lot wrong, it was hard to identify what I was doing that was right. Our parish had been wounded by a previous um, clergy experience and uh, I was held at arm's length for quite a while. Now, how did you, how did you went over the congregation to help knock down that barrier that had been put in place prior to you arriving? Mm -hmm. I don't think I did. I think we all just lived together long enough to where we began to trust and then care for each other. Now, your wife and your daughters, uh, how did they respond to this a new area and seeing you work with barriers that were in place that may not have been there uh, before where you were? Well, our daughters were hmm, five and one. So they were not much aware. My wife was, was very aware and uh, we had lots of chats about what life was gonna look like and uh, whether we wanted to remain where we were. What kept, what kept you here? Uh, because I've been in a situation before in Northern Virginia where my wife told me one day, uh, get me out of here as fast as you can, whatever you have to do. And two weeks later, we arrived in Greensboro. What was it that kept your wife eager or willing to stay here? And what, what did you say to, to prompt that? Well, this sounds a little more preachy than I am comfortable feeling, but I think God wanted me to be here. And the way I interpreted that, uh, I had no options that were not lateral. And uh, so I stayed because there was no place for me to go that wasn't lateral. And then um, as we'd been here a few years and things got, got better, uh, our children were at a place where I didn't want to pull them out of high school. And then my wife, wife finished college here and then went to graduate school. And by the time it got where <laughs> uh, I was getting options to be elsewhere, I didn't want to go. And I think that was God's spirit at work because trust me, I was looking earlier. So now that you stayed and your children are grown, um, you've weathered the storms, can you see the direction that the congregation has gone and you've watched it grow, you've watched other families have families that became adults too. What goes through your mind when you see the change that has happened since you've been here? Well, I think we sobered up a bit. 50-50 um, giving was a wonderful um, idea and it worked great until we needed a new roof and money had been given away in an appropriate, generous, good stewardship manner but we had to deal with the realities that we had financial responsibilities that we were then beginning to have to face. Up until then, the building was new and, and you know, we could pretty much keep up with our bills, but money had a lot to do with it. I'm loving what's happened since I stopped being the rector. Um, I'm not on the payroll and I'm not getting any kickbacks from Kathy, but I think our clergy leadership right now is just absolutely exceptional. And I love being a part of it. And I, I, it was time for me to pass the baton. And with Kathy and Lisa um, running with the baton, from my perspective, it's a great job. How difficult of a, dis of a discussion was it with, with uh with everyone when you said we, we can't do 50-50 anymore. Because uh, I'm certain after a, a period of time of that being the norm to deviate from that, there must have been some heavy discussions. How, how did you guys get through that time period? Well, Dre, it was, it was uh, I don't know that it was my leadership. I think we all just kind of sobered up. We realized that, that uh, well, there was one thing. We, we had to never remember Canvas and, and that's all about stewardship, but it's also about money. 
And I wrote the congregation, I said, folks, what we have pledged is not sufficient for us to be a parish. And either we're gonna take responsibility for being a self-sufficient parish, or we're gonna to have to ask the diocese to allow us to go back to mission status, which a mission in our denomination is a church that is not self-sufficient financially. And obviously we didn't want that to happen because people then reevaluated their pledges and, and we were able to make some good strides at that point. I'm guessing that was somewhere around 1980. Now, everyone, that is how you begin an oral history. It's not difficult. We've all done it. It's, it's one of those situations. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You want to go pick it or Mr. Miles? What do you want me to call you? Pick it. All right, pick it. <laughs> so often what we will also do uh, in the beginning part of an oral history, uh, you would dive into a person's uh, family history as well. Uh, so you would ask questions uh, about how did you get to this point? You know, what schools did you go through? Uh, were you bullied, you know, when you were in schools? And in this situation, it would say, I would ask the question, what brought you to religion? Uh, because I have interviewed some people before who at four years old, you know, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a, a firefighter. I want to be a police officer. Uh, it's rare that I find anyone uh, that's within uh, any, any form of religion do they say, I was at four years old, this was the career that I wanted. You know, there's always a defining moment uh, that you arrive at that says, this is how I got here. So asking questions that are pertinent and being able to follow up the way that I was asking questions, you know, where, you know, Pickett said, I, we sobered up. And, you know, we, the 50-50, you ask questions about the process that happened because there wasn't just one day you walk and say, oh, we're not doing 50-50 anymore, that's it. You know, how did you get to that? How did, how were the, how were the statements taken? You know, was there any pushback? How did people give other options, you know? So you want to make sure that you're asking questions to understand how you got to each step of the way. Normally an hour, hour and a half, you get a chance to get a lot of information. I have had some oral histories where they said, you know, can you bring extra uh, cards for the camera because I've got a lot to say. And that individual really had a lot to say because two days later, we were still going back to the house to do the interview. If I'm not mistaken, the interview ended up being 29 hours. And that by far is the longest amount of tape I have on anybody. Uh, but it was very important because this individual walked me through, I grew up in, I think it was it, uh, Matarey, Matarey, uh, Louisiana, and ended up in Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh was retirement. I'm like, how do you end up in Pittsburgh from Louisiana? Well, here's what happened. And it just went from there. So being able to let a person tell their story and not lead them is also very critical when collecting oral histories because I can force you into answering a specific question, but if I give you a generic enough question, you still have agency over the story and the narrative that you are, are, are telling. Uh, that's important to me to allow people to have their own stories. Um, again, going back to Charlottesville uh, two weeks ago, there was a woman who was suffering with dementia and the family said, oh, she's fine, it's okay. Uh, just as long as she does the interview with her sister, you know, she'll give you a good interview. And being able to identify issues within, within collecting oral histories is also important. And I didn't wanna continue with her interview after I asked two basic questions uh, that I, when I, I ask these questions of people who I, I recognize are dealing with cognitive disor disorders. And I asked, I said, so how, what do you remember about your dad? Tell me about your dad. And she says, man, I had some good chicken this morning. The second question I asked her, I said, so tell me, tell me about today. You know, what are you doing here today? Uh, and what do, what do we want to talk about? And she says, well, 
right now I'm going to go to my kitchen and I'll get you something to drink. We were nowhere near her home. And being able to identify those types of situations uh, is very helpful uh, to not only you, not only to the interview, but preserving the dignity of the individual as opposed to running them through a terrible situation where here they are on video and the last video we may have of them is of them being interrogated by a person who's not, not preserving them. Preserving memory is important and we should never, when you're doing oral history interviews, you should never proceed with an interview where you realize that the person may not have the memory uh, to go forth and preserving their dignity becomes a priority at that point. Uh, so much so that that interaction has led me to begin writing an article on how to handle oral history interviews with people suffering with cognitive disorders because I'm certain I'm not the first that's gonna do this, but I wanna give something to the field where we understand it's okay you know, to not go forth with that type of interview and preserving that person's dignity and not embarrassing their family or them is more important than running them through a litany of questions that they're not able to understand or answer. So it's, this is the complex part of doing oral histories where you realize you have to know when to say no and when to go forward. Uh, what Pickett did uh, was, was great, minus the part of saying uh, UNC Chapel Hill, which we're not gonna get into tonight. Uh, <laughs> um, but given names of places where he had been, you know, Clemson, you know, so are you from Clemson originally, Pickett? No. Um, born in Rochester, my first uh, 11 years in Miami, Florida, and then Asheville, North Carolina was home base mm -hmm. until military school in Chapel Hill or in, in Chattanooga and then Chapel Hill. Okay. That is the University of North Carolina. Oh, here we go. <laughs> so you say Clemson, Clemson as in Clemson, North Carolina, I mean, South Carolina. Correct. Okay. So by him saying Clemson, what that does, that opens up another door. Then you ask these questions. So I would point to this right here, do you, do you see this frame? Yeah. Okay, that is rice from a plantation in South Carolina, not far from Clemson. So now what it is, is you play the association part. So, you know, you say Chapel Hill, I say state. So now you have that to open up. So why did you go to North Car uh, UNC instead of North Carolina State? you know, Clemson, what was your time like? What did you see? What you, so now that you have these places, now we can, we can identify and see what you glean from those individual spaces and what it was like for you there and what you brought from there with you to Virginia. So, excuse me, oral histories also offer that up to you. And at the end of it all, you begin to realize that you have more memories of places than you thought you did because you may have gone to Chapel Hill, but how often now, so you don't like Duke. I respect it as a fine institution, but I would prefer Chapel Hill to win. And I agree with you on that. So there, see, we have that in common. And you talk about moments in classrooms, sporting events and so forth, because all of this, and so you were in the military, you know, your military career gets discussed, you know, why did you go into the military? Because everybody did not get drafted, you know, contrary to, to public opinion, you know, for certain, certain wars. You know, some people went in because they wanted to. Some people were uh, in ROTC programs. So you ask these types of questions. And ultimately the goal is to get a full scope of the individual and to see how social and historic events impacted their lives and how their story fits within the timeline of history. As historians, the first thing we wanna do is monitor the change over time. Uh, for instance, the pandemic 
you know, when it began, there was a rush by historians to begin collecting, you know, and I'm, I'm no different. I mean, I have masks uh, that people have, were wearing from the early parts of the pandemic. Um, I have some medical bracelets from people who were admitted to hospitals. Um, I have pictures, you know, so I have my own timeline for how things go. But mentally is the timeline that you really want because things change for people. How did your impact your change? And, and what made you think differently? Um, so within oral histories, these are things that are very important to collect because they're not written everywhere. Um, history will tell us that there was a pandemic that started and come May of 2020, it started in 2020 and of May, 2021, there were vaccines that had seen the pandemic numbers begin to decrease. That's what history books will tell you. Everybody that I get a chance to talk to, their stories will go along with that. And it adds to the meat and potatoes in the books because now you as the person become the history. We have the documented, but now we have your documentation which makes it real. So what other questions do we have? I'm, I'm doing so much talking. Feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself um, if you want to ask a question. Uh, not so much a question, but uh, a realization that, uh, Dre, you, you've developed a skill set that doesn't just come overnight. It takes a lot of practice to do what you do the way you do it to get results. Yeah, I guess you could say that. Um, my thing is, I've, I've heard the word subject used often, and it just sounds so impersonal, so inhumane. Um, I prefer people. You know, I, I, get, I get to talk to people. Um, and for the most part, like I said, my career uh, as a journalist, you know, there are certain things that you can collect. You know, we, we all, as a, as a journalist, I had access to people's criminal records. Uh, in some cases we had credit reports. I mean, when they say the, the media and, and Big Brother, I can tell you, we have access to some things that the general public would be like, how did you get that? I mean, you ever notice how something happens to a person and the, and the media will say that, you know, waiting to, for confirmation from family, but we have this person, we have access to more than people think. And for me, that's a lot of power to have. And what do you do with that power? You know, I could write articles day in, day out and use it to exploit people, or I could use that to really get a person's real story. You know, so it, it became an obligation of mine uh, and I still think about this to this day. This is the rule I live by. What would my grandma say? Hmm. You know, my grandmother is still alive and I, I still talk to her. Um, but everything I do for the most part, I think if, would my grandmother be satisfied with the way I handle the situation? You know, my mom is still alive, but my grandma, I mean, I, I, who wants to see the disappointment on that grandmother's face? Hmm. I don't, you know. And I still hear my grandfather, if I, if I, every time I did something bad, he would go, boy, boy. So if I ever hear that in my head, I have to change what I'm doing because I'm doing it wrong. So wanting to hear people's stories and wanting them to heal from whatever traumatic memory that they have uh, is very important to me. So the skill set came because I didn't want to disappoint my grandparents. You know, they put a lot into me and they expect a lot from me. So that's where that came from. But there's a personality type that's associated with being good at what you do as well. I, I, I grew up in New England and I have a certain amount of Eng New England reserve, which comes from my family, not just having been in Vermont. However, I'm married to a, a girl from North Carolina and she will know how many grandchildren everyone in front and behind us have before I've taken my coat off at the theater. <laughs> that sounds 
like me, uh, my wife asked, why do you always talk to people? I said, because it's interesting. You know, I do. I'm that person when, they, when, they, when you hear somebody say they never met a stranger, I feel like, you know, everybody hasn't spoken tonight, but I'm like, hey, we've all been here together. How you guys been? <laughs> you know, and you just get that degree of comfort. And, you know, I, I think the greatest thing that I've ever done uh, when it came to getting a story, and this was in North Carolina, uh, this was in Asheboro, North Carolina. And I had asked a member of the White Knights, a uh, member of, the, of, the, of the, the KKK, I said, so what is your favorite dish? What do you like to eat? And the look on his face was like, why is this person? I didn't care. I wanted to know, like, what do you like to eat? Uh, with the sit-ins uh, that happened in North Carolina, uh, they had done an interview with people. Uh, and one of the people who they talked to was the, the bus boy that day of, of the, of, well, one of the bus boys from the sit-ins. And I said, the day that they allowed you all to eat at the, at the restaurant, at the, can at the uh, Woolworth, what did you order? And everybody else had asked him, oh, was it tough? Was it hard? I wanted to know what he ate. And he ordered, and this was disgusted me as, as a northerner, smothered liver with onions, <laughs> green beans, okra, and cornbread. Everything but the liver was fine. And I said, why? And he said, every time that I'd be in the back washing dishes, it smelled like the meal that my grandmother would prepare. And I smiled every day that they made it because it reminded me of how good my childhood was. And it was his moment to shine to talk about his grandmother. And it was just, you know, these things, being able to ask the right questions or being able to ask a question, you know, will lead you down a road that will, that will fill in something. And, uh, a lot of people didn't realize that the bus boys and the servers were the first people that they allowed to eat because they were safe. They were employed there. They weren't going to rock the boat. So knowing that every time that they made that meal, he was going, oh, I remember my grandma. And it, it made his work easier that day. So that was fun. What other questions do we have? Dre, I really appreciate the way you are elevating the story, the, the, the idea of story. We, we all have stories, of course, but we downplay our own experiences, right? We were like, it's just something I went through. I'm over it, it's, you know. So what you're doing in the Episcopal world is you're kind of making the story a sacrament is the way we talk about it. Like a sacrament is something that shows us God, right? And so, that seems very meaningful to me that what you're doing is you're, you're, you're preaching to us about the fact that our stories are part, part of a great story, right? Uh, and that's so important because it's like, um, it's like the dry bones, right? We just think, uh, you know, I graduated from high school this year and I got married this year. So we, we tell the stories as the dry bones, but you're putting flesh on it. And that's, very feels very meaningful to me. I, I I thank you for that. Oh no problem. This is this is like I said. It's fun. You know, I, I get paid to do something I like to do. Like it's just amazing. And is it Miss Sharf? Is that how you pronounce your name? Yes, yes. Blanche is fine. Thank you, Dre, for everything that you've said. It's so uh, meaningful and to me, especially. I think. Um, I wonder, did you, I'm interested in how you're able to listen so carefully that you can ask the follow-up questions that give you more information. Is there, is there a way, I mean, is there any, you know, is it just listening and being in tune with that? Or how do you, how do you know what, what you should ask next? I genuinely care about everything that everybody says. I don't sit down with anybody that I don't genuinely want to hear from. Uh, years ago, and this goes back to my grandmother again, my grandmother said, listen to me when I'm talking to you. And just like, 
I am listening because I heard you say that. And now that I am a parent, you know, I have twin girls that are five. And one of them, was it last week? Daddy, listen to me. I want to tell you something. Instantly, I'm just like, this is my grandmother all over again. Good grief. And it's the one of my twins who looks like my grandmother. But it's just something that has been ingrained in me for so long. However, I was able to sit in a room of about maybe 12 people last week and heard every conversation that was going on at the same time. Just be, I guess because of journalism, my ear is just tuned to sp just pan the room. But to me, it's important when somebody is talking to pay attention. You know, paying attention is something I thought I was doing when I was listening to my grandfather, but I guess I was wrong. And I'll never get that back, you know. Uh, November 30th, 1993, 7.26 in the PM when he died, those stories went with him. And I didn't listen good enough, you know, to the point now that some of them at the, the ripe old age of 42 are starting to disappear from me. And I realized that when I went to tell my kids about my grandfather, I didn't remember some of the good stories he told. So I have to recreate those stories by going and like for the past six months, I've been looking through all kinds of files. And I found out that my grandfather, he told me that he graduated high school. He dropped out of school in the fifth grade. You know, so I'm, I'm finding out these things and it doesn't diminish who he is, but it's important enough of a person, you know, and again, just the word subject is, I don't know, that just sounds so impersonal, you know, but my grandfather was important. Uh, the same way uh, when, when Pickett was talking to me, it was important, minus the, the Chapel Hill stuff. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was important to hear his perspective and where he was coming from. And it's intriguing because now, Pickett, the whole time you were talking to me, I saw young Pickett. I was able to envision you going through that. And I wanted to know more. Your life became a movie to me that I just wanted to keep seeing and learning from. So when, you, when you're talking with a person doing an oral history, it's very critical that you focus on what they're saying because mm -hmm. um, you could miss something. Like Piggy could have said, yeah, you know, you know, when I left Clemson and I had $5 in my pocket, but by the time I got to, to Asheville, I only had 50 cents. Well, what happened along the way? Did you get something to eat? Did you get some pulled pork when you got to Lexington, North Carolina? Did you get a chair, a chair wine? Did you get a coat? What happened? So now I'm building up on this story and it becomes, as I'm listening to people, it becomes this motion picture and it's just amazing. And you get to share that aspect because once he talks about what he spent the money on, that becomes another layer to the story. So it's, it's, I just pay attention to those little things because at some point those little things become a big old mountain. I wish I had met you long ago because I took lots of notes from my grandparents, but I didn't get the flesh. I just got the bones. <laughs> so it's a, it's a pleasure. Maybe one day, uh, do you still have those notes? I do, yeah. Then maybe one day we'll have another session on how to put the meat on those bones because uh, pulling up the files and doing a genealogy work on my grandfather, that's, I guess, another skill set that I've been able to do. Now, mm -hmm. I realize that he was not born in Red Springs, North Carolina. He was born in Shannon, North Carolina, and he went into Red Springs, which is the neighboring town, to share crop. Uh, I found all this out through research. So if you, at another time, Lisa, if you want, we can, we can even discuss that part of it because that, that's pertinent to what I do. And often it goes down that road anyway. That would be great. Thank you. Sure. I know you, you had mentioned the sheet um, you were going to share, and I don't know if that's something you just want to send us later or you want us to look at it. I'm just conscious of um, we're coming up towards eight. So, um. so what this is here uh, is a sheet that I put together. I call it a cheat sheet uh, because often once you get into an interview or you have an oral history that you're about to start, sometimes we freeze. 
a good friend of mine is a pilot in the Navy and I was talking to him and I said, how do you do this? He goes, I don't know. Sometimes I forget. And I said, at what point do you forget? He said, usually about 30,000 feet in the air and climbing. <laughs> and I said, so how do you get beyond that part? And he said, sometimes I make a little cheat sheet and I just, I just keep it on, on the yoke so I can look at him like, okay, I can do this. And I said, you do realize that that's my tax dollars that you're playing with up there and you know, just to make sure. But this sheet here um, goes over your roles. Um, narrator, like some people use the term interviewee. Eh, I like the narrator because this is your story. You're narrating your own story. And, you know, it's important that you have agency over that. So terms like subject, uh, some uh, terms like interviewee, to me, just water it down narrator or griot just sounds so powerful it gives you agency of your story and that's what this will go over so researching your topic before you set up your interviews is very important if i'm working on a story about pittsburgh and the food scene in pittsburgh with the heinz factory and so forth why am i talking to a person in montana who has never been to pittsburgh nor do they provide anything to Pittsburgh? No, I need to talk to people from Pittsburgh. I need to talk to people who may have worked in the steel mills and lived in surrounding areas because their story becomes a part of what built Pittsburgh, you know? Uh, and I'm, I'm using Pittsburgh not because of you, Lisa, but when my grandfather got out of World War II, he moved to Pittsburgh and worked in the steel mills. That was his job. And he talked about food that was served. He said, you know, Often what I, I do remember this story because it was just yummy and I love food, but he had said, I never forget the whistle would blow for lunch and there'd be an old lady out there selling pierogies. And if you know anything about Pittsburgh, pierogi <laughs> is very big in Pittsburgh. <laughs> it's just one of those things that, yeah, you're going to get a good pierogi there. So understanding that now your questions become well why are pierogies big in Pittsburgh and then you get into the, the cultural heritage aspect because pierogies are very much a part of the Polish uh, uh, culture and now you see what all communities were in Pittsburgh that built this one city and you realize how different things were that played a part in becoming one space so that's why it's good to research your topic uh, and going back to what I'd said before about selecting the right people to talk, you want to select your narrators and make sure you have the right people for what you're looking into. If we're talking about, you know, how did Williamsburg come to be, having somebody talk about Miami and not put Williamsburg in the context really doesn't do us no, it, it does you no justice. Um, drafting your questions is something that I do I draft a just the most mundane questions. Tell me where you're from. How old are you? Um, what are, where'd you go to school? How many kids do you have? How long have you been married? Because each one of those that you give, you may say, I've been married for 25 years and we got married on a Wednesday. How did it work for 25 years? How did you guys meet? You see, your basic questions will always spawn follow-up questions. And paying attention to what a person says will also give you that as well. Um, and then, like I've said before, uh, the, the agency is to the narrator. So be an ear. You know, this isn't your oral history. This is their oral history. You're just asking the questions to help record this moment. Uh, and then you want to think about next steps. Uh, I've done oral histories before. And I've had, you know, I've never forget in college, uh, I'd done some oral histories. I'm like, what am I going to do with all of this? And I created a documentary. And the documentary has, you know, has made its way around different film festivals. But, you know, it could be a situation for, for the church. You can make a church celebrating the, uh, the uh, anniversary. And you have all of these voices. Um, I'm also a big proponent. I'm working with another organization now to develop uh, as a YouTube site to put all their oral histories on there. Because as I said before, eventually the one part about life that we know will happen in the physical, we won't be here. Having those voices and having them stored somewhere where people can go to hear them and hear, you know, how did you talk 
uh, the congregation into leaving a 50-50? You know, how did you grow the congregation? Hey, how did Lisa get to the congregation? You know, those are going to be questions that future generations are going to want to know the answers to. And by developing a place to, to store these oral histories, I can't think of a better usage for technology, you know, because and for those, you know, kids, grandkids, great grandkids, you're going to become somebody people want to know more about. So it's important to think about the next steps because you don't want to have oral histories that end up on the floor. And I have seen that far too many times than I would like to even admit. So if that's also something you would, you know, want to consider, I can help you set that up so that you, you have a repository of all of your, your oral histories. But the best part of it is you have agency over how it's displayed. Mm -hmm. I'm very big on not having agency over other people's stories. I just listen, you guys do what you want to do with them and I can walk you through every step. I, I went to a church in New Jersey. Um, I'm, I'm from New Jersey originally. But as a young person and as a young married woman, when I was in that church, they had something called super seniors. And what they did with super seniors, they were people who were 80 and up. They would have different times when the congregation, we'd have a meal and then these people would tell us their story. And I found out some of the most interesting things about Sparta, New Jersey, which is kind of in the country about this one doctor that we had who used to ride, you know, a horse and carriage and go throughout the county, but it was the most fascinating and wonderful thing to do that. And I think that's something that's worth a consideration in any um, church, you know, thinking, taking your people. I know we have, Mer we had Myrtle off and on talking to us mm. and she was a wonderful person who was uh, part of St. Martin's, but things like that are really priceless. That's a great segue, Judy, because um, next week, Barb Watson, Myrtle's daughter, is going to be with oh, okay. us this yeah. time, and we're going to uh, do a little storytelling about Myrtle um, and show some pictures, and um, and it's, you know, all part of our, our exploring of the different layers of our history, and um, as Kathy said, uh, Dre, you have just um, made it all the more rich. I mean, my, my head is kind of spinning right now with all of the possibilities and um, it's just so, uh, it's just wonderful how, I mean, there's so much resonating with um, what we've been doing and even things, uh, we did a, a sacred food story series in Advent. So all the things you were sharing about um, people's, people's food stories was just resonating with, with that, so. It just, um, I've, I've got goosebumps. Um, so I'm so grateful, so grateful for your being with us tonight. And Pickett, thank you so much for being the narrator. Um, I love that. Um, we're all narrating the story together and, uh, and living it out. So. Um, Is one more question. Is that from David? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Dre, um, I. Um, I like very much what you're what you're doing because it, it really humanizes uh, who people are, what 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 they who what what their experience is about, and I'm I'm wondering what what application there might be uh, in terms of uh, applying it more broadly to uh, helping people dialogue, you know, uh, between each other in terms of understanding where they're coming from. Uh, you know, we have differences uh, in terms of what we believe, and some may lean far to the left or to the right, or they may be white or black. Uh, you know, is there some application that you can make to what you're doing that would apply to a, a community of faith, uh, looking at how we can talk better with each other, or talk more fully with each other, or understand and get to know each other more fully? There is one thing and I have never seen it fail. And I'm certain you've done it before. I'm certain Lisa's done it before. I'm definitely sure Kathy has done it. Ted has done it. Uh, Pickett did it tonight. I've never seen anybody not react to the word hello. 
again, talking with a Klansman who I don't even understand what he was upset about that day, but you know, I asked what he ate. I said, hello, how are you? And his response was, hi, and you? But it was that barrier. And it, it, it's a sign of, I come in peace. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not coming with an angry approach, like, ah, I, what are you doing? Once you start asking the, the five W questions, that's <laughs> usually where things go different because uh-huh. now you are interrogating instantly. Yeah. But hello is the most simple thing. And it's something I taught my girls to do. We had a neighbor in North Carolina who would not speak. And I said, you always say hello to people regardless because people are people and your words can change that day and that history at that very moment. Why did I say that? Because that's all they say to everybody they see, but they get the same response. Hey, how are you? And it starts to dialogue instantly. Uh, Being able to associate. uh, And I learned this from a woman in Williamsburg recently. I'd done an oral history with a member of uh, First Baptist Church. And again, being from the North, one thing that you hear uh, in history is just terrible with this. Racism segregation was all in the South. That, that's the first thing you hear that, that, that we're taught. And what I'm learning uh, through research is that is that couldn't be further from the truth. Mm-hmm. Um, because my wife is from Detroit, had no idea that five miles from where she grew up was a plantation, had no idea. Mm-hmm. You know, so that debunks that part of history. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when the woman, I, I said, so how segregated was it? How hard was it for you? And that was my ignorance for assuming that she had it hard. And she said, I always had white friends growing up and we would get ice cream together. And it floored me because then it, it, what it did was it, it took me to my childhood. Yeah. And the ice cream truck came through the neighborhood. No matter what you look like, your goal was to get ice cream from that truck. Right. Commonality. <laughs> the commonality of that with kids and often what I do is I ask questions about childhoods because that tells you a good story too that will that will set the course for my next questions for people um but when she said that I was like oh god I don't I don't have anything planned for this one but I, I what do I ask now and I said so those same friends though you're black and your friends were white where did you guys practice religion was it together or separate and she said, oh no, religion was separate. School was separate. Life was together. Hmm. Huh. And it was probably the most profound thing that i had ever heard in my life because here I was an ignorant Yankee assuming hmm. that life was this horrible time period. And it was the greatest thing for her and her family. She said, we would play and our parents wouldn't really talk much. We wouldn't go into each other's homes, but our parents supported us playing together. And it really made me look at life in the South differently, you know, and it made me revisit what I had learned, you know, growing up and what I had missed in college. You know, here I am, this person with a title of historian, I'm I'm floored by this Mm -hmm. aspect of coexisting. Hmm. So being able to start with just that basic word of hello opens a lot of doors and it, it's worked for me in this country. It's worked with me overseas. And I realize now it is the international way of saying I come in peace. Hmm. So being able to start with that in a conversation, uh, I have noticed will ultimately open many doors for you because it starts to dialogue. You know, the next, the response to hello is, I'm fine, how are you? Doors open at that point, can you close it? I uh, continue um, to you all night, but I do wanna honor our time. Um, And we had talked at the beginning about uh, maybe ending with some prayer. Is, Is that something you feel comfortable doing or you want me to do and Do you want to chime in or what, Andre? You can do it, but I just want to add, uh, thank you all for having me. I really appreciate this time. And add the family of the the Congolese family 
Uh, this was one of the biggest stories of my la of, of the end of my journalism career. Uh, it was three years ago on this date uh, that a family uh, on May 12th, uh, 2018, uh, a woman had gone to work and her five kids were at home. And when she returned, she returned to a charred home mm. where three, two of her kids had died in the fire and the other three were in the hospital. And on Mother's Day, which was the day after uh, May 13th, 2018, mm. the last three of her children died. And it was one of those stories that I just, I always wonder whatever happened to the mother. You know, I watched her tuck in each of her kids in their caskets and put a teddy bear in each one. Mm. And it was the one moment where I realized just how fragile life is and how important it was to be able to tell stories. So just add them and their, their community to the prayer. Absolutely. Thank you again so much. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this time together, for the ways that you are with us uh, as we narrate our lives and share our stories. And you're with your people in, um, in all the brokenness of this world. We remember especially this family from the Congo. We remember the people of Israel and Palestine the people of India and places all over the world that are still um, in the grip of this pandemic. And we ask that you will open our hearts to each other, that you will help us uh, hear each other and, and put flesh on our, our bones, these stories. We thank you for the gift of your presence with us and all the ways that you weave together our stories and uh, and make it all make sense somehow, uh, at least some of the time. Be with us uh, as we go to the rest of our evening. Bless Andre and his work and uh, keep us close to you. Amen. Amen. I'd like to say one more thing and that is Andre, we would love to have you and your family anytime to worship with us at St. Martin's. Uh, we're currently worshiping in our parking lot, which is a wonderful blessing with trees. We have the sanctuary of nature all around us and um, we can hook you up with a sign that we're keeping um, attendance, of course, because we're of pro you know, COVID protocols, but we'd love to have you. So please, please come join us. I will share that with, with the, the the ruler of the house because I am just secondary. So I will run that by the wife. I understand. I too am a person under authority. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And, and we will everyone. talk more about this project and, uh, and how we can, can uh, continue to, to work together. So well, tomorrow, uh, those numbers that I have expect people to be called tomorrow. I'm going into the office to do that. So be ready to to have your 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 stories told and shared. I'm ready. Let's do it. Great. Great. Hey, Andre, did have you seen Rob and Lisa? Rob, do that again. I saw some. There was the screen went dark. I didn't. See <laughs> <it>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow, that's harsh. Uh, that's harsh. No way to follow that. Got to go. Got to go now. Bye, folks. Thank you Bye. for sharing your gift. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you all. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dre. Thank you.